In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Dynamics, your leaders in premium performance. And with thanks to the All Seasons Phillip Island Resort. much ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, for those of you who are unaware in pit lane is in fact the longest running australian motorsport live program and we go to air for our first program for 2012 tomorrow at nine o'clock where you will see a little bit of this particular uh, this particular interview i was uh, like i said i should be home right now doing all the editing and the writing but when i had the opportunity to uh, speak to our guest tonight it was just too good an opportunity to miss out on somewhere in the uh, in the boxes and boxes and many many boxes of magazines I've got is an old edition of Racing Car News. And Racing Car News was famous for its uh, for its uh, its paintings on its cover, and one of them I remember specifically is was a uh, was a painting of our guest tonight. He is an icon of Australian motorsport in the 1960s. Not only is he a two-time Australian drivers champion, but he has also uh, had great success in both touring cars and sports cars. Gives me great pleasure to uh, to join me at the lectern at the moment. Please welcome Mr. Spencer Martin. <laughs> Spencer, thanks, thanks for joining us. The, the interesting thing was in, in, your, in your golden day, I mean, you were, you were at the top of your, of your form and then suddenly you more or less disappeared and a lot of people were asking you know, what happened. So in those years, what, what did happen? Well, I'd been driving for um, 10 years. Uh, I didn't have a dollar in the bank and uh, I thought it was time, well, I'd met a lovely lady and I was getting married and uh, I needed to make some money. And, if I had a dollar for every uh, race I'd won, I'd be all right, but, uh, uh, or a dollar for every pat on the back, but uh, uh, it was time to move on. So I was driving for Bob Jane at the time, and uh, that was 1967, and uh, I told Bob that I was going to move on. And, of course, Bob being a very, notoriously a very, very good payer, a very generous man, now he would have, uh, he would have been terribly upset about that. No, well, in those days, Bob was a different man. It was a, it, I got on very well with Bob. Uh, Bob, um, he uh, spent the money on the car, and uh, you're only as good as the car you sit in, and the car I had was as good as anybody's, and, um, uh, you know, nobody's ever won the Melbourne Cup on a donkey, so you've got to have a good car. And I had a good car, and um, I got the results, yeah. Let's go right back to the beginning. I mean, what is your <coughs> earliest motorsport memory? What was the inspiration that got you behind the wheel initially? Well, I go right back to the very early um, uh, or late 50s, uh, Mount Druitt, which is a, uh, it was, was a racetrack up in Sydney. And, um, you know, uh, they had mainly MG specials, um, supercharged TCs, and I suppose half the field was MG TCs in those days. Well, that will make Charles Rogers very happy. Yeah, <laughs> Charles didn't tell me he had one of those. No, I think Charles and his family have got most of the MGs that are lying around Australia at the moment. But uh, mm. what was your first car, your first race car? Well, in those days, you had to build your car. And um, I had a little, um, it was an Elva design frame and uh, had a, what's, what's called a KM200 fiberglass body, which is all a bit technical, I suppose. But, and it had a little Triumph Herald engine in it. But it did over 100 miles an hour. And um, it didn't compete with the Lotuses and Coopers of the day, but uh, uh, I was noticed in it because it, was, um, it performed quite well for a home-built special. That was one of the things about in, back in those days is we had what were called Australian specials and yeah. it's something we don't see nowadays when sort of Australian ingenuity was at work and, and people would make cars in their backyard and they would take on the, uh, take on the classics of the day, the Ferraris and the Lotus and all the rest of it. From, the, from that particular car, when did, you, when did you move to then? Well, I went to work for a, <coughs> a guy by the name of Clive Adams and Clive and um, uh, Jack Pryor uh, Pryor and Adams, they built a car which was called a Prad. And uh, they built a series of racing cars. And um, uh, I went to work for those guys. I wanted to learn how, especially how to build aluminium bodies. Um, but uh, uh, after a couple of years, I said to Clive that I was going to leave. And um, 
So Clive said that uh, if I stayed for another 12 months, he would give me his current Prad racing car. And um, so I, com I completely rebuilt that and modified it. And um, I was noticed by David Mackay, who had Scuderia Veloce. Now, David was a very mm. sort of famous uh, figure in Australian motorsport, and uh, mm. through David Mackay, you mm. got to, to move to a completely different level of race car. What was the first car you drove for, for David? Well, if you just move back a little bit, um, I competed with uh, Norm Beachy up at uh, Catalina Park um, about 1962 when Norm had an early model Holden where um, I was the king of Catalina Park in Holdens and Norm came up to get me. And uh, he was driving for Scuderia Veloce and, um, um, and I ended up getting Norm. So uh, what happened then was David had my motor sealed. He put 10 quid down to have my motor sealed and um, uh, when they found the motor was all legitimate, uh, uh, David wanted me to drive for him. But uh, Norm, uh, Norm went on to drive for David for a couple of years. He had the Chevy Impala and a few other cars, but uh, David said even if he had the Vatican sponsorship, he couldn't keep affording Norm. So uh, Norm moved on as well. It was, uh, in many ways, your story is a bit parallel with that of Peter Brock. I mean, somebody who, who came up with, the, with an Australian special and, and was really so good that a lot of people said, well, is it the car or is it him? And they eventually found out it was you. Oh, well, that's very kind. <laughs> but yes, it, well, actually what happened was um, um, after I'd uh, had that episode with Norm, then David got me to drive in 1963 in the... Um, uh, the Armstrong 500 with a guy by the name of um, Brian Muir. And Brian Muir was making a name for himself in England. And um, so Brian came out and I drove with him at Bathurst. Uh, we didn't finish the race, but David was very impressed. And uh, he uh, said that he liked me to drive his Brabham, which was um, a really a Formula One car, a two and a half litre Brabham. And um, so uh, he was very good. I, he gave me time to get used to the car and um, so I eventually settled in and uh, uh, we got some results. So back in those days, I mean, you know, probably this was the, the time where, where touring cars were just on the rise, but still open wheel racing in Australia was con very much considered the pinnacle. Uh, who were some of the people you were competing with uh, once you went to the, to the level of the Cam's Gold Star? Uh, well, it was uh, Leo Gagan, um, <clears throat> uh, Greg Cusack, uh, Johnny Harvey. Uh, those guys had uh, V8 Repcos and um, I had a four-cylinder motor, exactly the same as in this car here. And uh, the, uh, for the 1966 Gold Star, the, the Repcos weren't very reliable. So um, I walked in with a nice, reliable uh, Coventry Climax motor. Which is interesting because in many respects that sort of mirrors what Sir Jack Brabham did at the World Championship level. He went in with a, with a fairly simple, straightforward car mm. that outlasted yeah. all of the new three-litre cars and won, a, mm. won an unlikely World Championship. Exactly. Well, <clears throat> um, the old four-cylinder Climax, which is in that uh, Cooper there, um, it's got a lot of torque. It's uh, relatively easy to drive, um, torque-wise, and the, the rep goes, they were like a light switch, you know. They were either right on it or off. So they're a bit difficult, and they had a lot of um, uh, oil problems with uh, ring sealing and things. So in 1966, the rep goes weren't reliable. Uh, 1967 was a different case altogether. Um, the rep goes, they had them reliable, and they had 30 or 40 horsepower more than a uh, Coventry Climax engine, so uh, it was a bit of a struggle. But luckily, uh, Cusack, Harvey and Gagan were fighting amongst themselves and uh, I snuck up over the line a few times. So apart from the open wheelers, as I said, you, you, and you mentioned some of the touring cars, but you also raced, uh, raced sports cars and, and yeah. before you left David Mackay, you raced one of what has become one of the most famous race cars, the most expensive race cars in the world, the Ferrari 250 LM. Mm. Uh, tell us about that. You raced that here at Sandown, I believed. Well, I did. Um, we could talk all night about the 250 LM. It was such a magnificent motor car. Uh, 1965, uh, Sandown Park was its first race. And um, I was a mechanic for Graham Hill. Graham was driving uh, our two and a half litre Brabham and uh, I was to drive the Ferrari. And, uh, but uh, Graham was, um, he liked the ladies, he liked the glamour and he liked the Ferrari and he tried to get into the Ferrari. And, um, Not to mention the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said it. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, so David, uh, he, he approached David and said I'd like to drive the Ferrari and um, David said no, he'd promised it to the boy 
<laughs> so uh, the boy got the drive, and uh, uh, we had a, um, a Stephen Bradbury race car actually won the race because uh, Frank Maddox broke down. So uh, uh, its first race it won, but it was a beautiful car. It had um, it was a rear engine. Uh, 12 cylinder Ferrari, which uh, one of the first rear engine 12 cylinders, and um, um, the noise inside and out of the car was magnificent. Uh, Revit to 8,000, and it just it was a beautiful thing. The interesting thing is, I think that car was sold many years later for many, many millions of dollars. So it was a, uh, it, it was certainly something. To, and to say that you've actually driven it, I mean, must be an absolute thrill. You've driven many uh, sort of similar cars of similar standards since then. Since you've come back, you've been involved in historic racing. Tell us some of the cars you've been in uh, that you've driven over the years. What in historics? Yeah, uh, uh, Ferraris. Um, well, I, I, I drove overseas for ten years. Um, at all the great tracks, you know, Silverstone, Magny Corps, Nürburgring, Spa, uh, and Laguna Seca a few times. And um, yeah, our, uh, Ferraris, um, 375 mm, um, 250 short wheelbases. Uh, um, gosh, I uh, have a bit of a brain lock there. Um, a 196 Dino was the one we had our most success in. It was a, a V6, obviously, front engine car that um, was a. Um, uh, a competitor for the 250TRs, the Testarossas. Oh, I drove one of those too, a 250 Testarossa pontoon, which they're worth 20 million now. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it was quite, um, quite a buzz to drive those. I arrived at Silverstone and um, um, the cars are left hand drive, which I didn't know, and it's pouring rain, and they said, that's the way you go. So away you go. And, um, I did two 360s in the rain and I thought, you better pull your head in, you won't be going home. <laughs> so what are you doing now? Are you, are you still racing or have you uh, hung up the helmet? Um, pretty much hung up the helmet. I had a drive um, a few years ago in the Brabham Alpha that Frank Gardner used to drive and, and Kevin Bartlett um, in the, the first Tasman Revival race. And uh, that was a big buzz to drive that car. I hadn't driven an open wheeler for 40 years and uh, I got in that car and... Uh, Put up a pretty good show, I thought. Came second by half a car length. And, um, but no, these days I'm fully retired. I play golf two days a week. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I still drive the occasional uh, historic car, yes. Mm. Well, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here in uh, here in, in Melbourne for the uh, for the Phillip Island the weekend for the Grand Prix and to open this particular uh, event. I understand that uh, you've got uh, you have some official duties to perform, so I shall uh, leave you to that. But for now, Spencer Martin, thanks for joining us. And thanks for joining us in pit lane. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Spencer Martin. <laughs> I'm Ariane Evans and I'm the Marketing, Sales and Service Administration Officer. The best thing about my job is the variety. The best thing about my job is manufacturing the best dinos in the world with the greatest team of people. The best thing about my job is the professional approach they take towards the product. Customer service is so important to Dino Dynamics because our customers are our lifeblood. Customer service is second only to product quality. Dino Dynamics is smart. Dino Dynamics is dinerific. If you're looking for a great place to stay for all the big events at Phillip Island, a family getaway or just to get away from your family, then head to the All Seasons Phillip Island Resort. Have a great meal in the Numbers Restaurant and Bar, wood-fired pizzeria, play tennis, work out in the gym or just relax by the pool. The All Seasons Phillip Island Resort is only three kilometres from the world-famous Grand Prix circuit and it's a great place to stay whether you're a racer, official or fan. The All Seasons Phillip Island Resort, proud supporters of local motorsport and in pit lane.